It's Friday. We're already feisty. We're already fired up. If only you knew. Charles Robinson, Frank Schwab, the great Frank Schwab, my good, dear friend, Frank Schwab. And I'm Jason Fitz. It's time for inside coverage on a Friday morning. Uh, gentlemen, how are we feeling? Like, I, I don't know. Are we getting punch drunk this late into the season? We're, we're this close to Thanksgiving, C Rob. Uh, you getting that second win? You feel, you feel the, the good, good goods? Oh, I'm feeling great. I mean, nobody's going to hear it, but you you forgot Frank's name in the first read yeah. of the show. <laughs> so if we want to go ahead and just step off on that foot, I feel great. That was, that was yeah, wonderful. That was payback for all I the wish... jokes I made when Fitz was out on Wednesday. I know it. I know it. I knew it was coming. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to start every Friday with by f- forgetting Frank's name. <laughs> yeah, and, and Frank's right. Like uh, I, I caught some heat for uh, Wednesday, pun intended, because I had none. I caught some heat Wednesday from Frank uh, for missing the show, and so maybe that was my payback. I'll, I'll just blame it on that. I'll take or, it. I'll take it. Yeah, or I'll yeah. blame it on the drugs. I don't know. It you is. Know, by I, the way, it is. I, I will say this. Like I, I don't know about you, Charles. Like like we've both covered this league a really, really long time. You do get to a point of like, oh my God, like it feels like the season's late, but it's not. You look up and you're like, wow, we got like months and months of this to go. And it, it does get to be dog days a little bit. And honestly, I, like I, I, there's a point to this. Like last week, I kind of felt that when like in, in, in with the teams where you saw some really good teams struggling. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. they've reached that point in the season where they're like, oh God, we just got to get through November. Like it, it, it does. There are dog days of the NFL season, no doubt for these players. Yeah, zero question. I mean, I... I... It's fun. It's funny because that Thursday night game, I'm sitting there and I'm staring at Jaden Daniels. And you and I are working the discussion, right? The the Yahoo Sports discussion on the app, the in game discussion, and you're kind of watching what people are saying and they're losing their minds about Terry McLaurin. And I'm like, no, we like Washington was due for a game like this. We're this yeah. late in the season. Teams are starting to figure out what they can do to slow other teams down, and this is where teams. Begin. How many times can I say teams, by the way? And this is where franchises start to learn what their shortcomings are, right? The second half of the season is where you're going to dial in, oh, this is what's really wrong with us. This is the thing yeah. that we we yeah. should have fixed before the trade line or that wasn't fixable by the trade deadline. And this is what we're going to have to grapple with the second half of the season. I don't think what we saw out of Washington was Cliff Kingsbury. I don't think what we saw out of Washington was a Jaden Daniels problem or a Terry McLaurin problem. I think it was... This is who Washington has been, and we're going to get to this game, so I don't want to dive too deeply into this. But I, I think this is what we're starting to see across the league now is, is the clear missing pieces of DNA for these clubs uh, are going to become more obvious down the stretch. Well, let's let's get into it. The Eagles win 26-18 over the Commanders in a game that, frankly, through three quarters, just I, I regretted that I took the time to watch it. Like, this was an ugly football game, y'all. Like, and uh, Terry McLaurin at one point had no targets deep into the game, and everybody was screaming and yelling about it. And Jaden Daniels for the second straight week. Pittsburgh did a nice job of this for the second straight week. It felt like running lanes were gone for Jaden Daniels. It just felt like both sides were struggling to get any real momentum, anything going. The only thing that worked in this game with any reliability was Saquon and Saquon was who Saquon has been like it's just Saquon is the best acquisition of the offseason it is clear right now that Saquon is absolutely Mm, vaulting the Eagles there's a running back in Baltimore that might disagree with you I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, it's really interesting. That offensive rookie, their offensive player of the year race is going to be very, very interesting because, yeah, you're, you're right. Saquon's been awesome. So is Derrick Henry. I mean, Derrick Henry's on pace for two grand, I think. So running backs, running backs making a comeback. That That is such one of the big themes of this NFL season and not just running backs, but old running backs, like not just the, we drafted this guy in the second round and he became a star, but the guys who like are under third contracts who are really balling out and helping teams. And now you wonder, does that change the market at all? We saw Chuba Hubbard get a big deal. I wonder like, you're going to say like, okay, we, we've, the, the pendulum swung too far on the whole devaluing running backs thing where you're seeing, look, when, when the Eagles signed Saquon, I was like, what are they doing? They never do this. They're the, always the, let's cheap out on running back team because we're going to patch it together. But he fit them perfectly. Derrick Henry fit the Ravens perfectly. Josh Jacobs having a good year with Green Bay. Uh, on and on and on. A lot of quote unquote old running backs really balling out this season. Yeah. And I think um, a, a conversation that I had, I was texting with somebody earlier in the week. Um, we were talking about Joe Mixon, obviously, yeah, uh, Mixon Derrick another, Henry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, some of these guys. And and he kind of said to me, like, it's going to be interesting because are we now starting to accept that maybe the running back shelf in terms of when we expect these guys just to fall off and no longer be productive players for us, maybe that needs to move. Maybe it's not 
27, you're getting a little itchy. You're like, okay, 28. All right. This is if, if you know, there's, we're probably not going to do an extension with this guy. If we do an extension, let's not take it any further than 29. Actually, maybe some of these guys are, are a little more productive beyond the years yeah. that we thought we're getting smarter about the rotation, the load sharing, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's, it's been a great thing to see what Saquon has they been able to do in Philadelphia because he's got the talent. The injuries were the thing that always got in the way. And I think when it happened, when he moved to Philly, we all thought it was the natural fit, right? Okay. This is the team with the offensive line. They know how to use um, mm-hmm. running backs. They they've craved a dominant running back like this for a long period of time. Now let's see if they can actually bring it all together. And they have, as long as Saquon doesn't get hurt down the stretch, there's no question in my mind He's the best player they have on their offense. He turns the key. AJ Brown's really? fantastic. I, I think it's AJ. I, know, I still think I know it's you AJ. think it's AJ. I know you do. And it, it's I get that, but I get yeah, uh, I understand the, what you're saying too. Like, yeah, it's it's a it's boy, it's one A, one B with those guys. It is, and, and it's close. It might yeah. be Lane Johnson for all we know. Like, I mean, like there's the, the Eagles got some dudes, man. Like they're we forgot about the Eagles. And I think that's a I, I can't I keep talking about this, especially on a Sunday night show and, and whenever that the Eagles are the what? Like the Eagles never fly under the radar, right? They we're always talking about the Eagles, but somehow this year we kind of forgot about the Eagles. Like no, I mean, I think that's fair them. though. We, we we've we forgot about him because the drama became bigger than football. Like right. once Sirianni. Sirianni was on the yeah, on the hot seat last year, it became all about that. Right. And, and he's yelling yeah, at so fans I, and all that kind of stuff. Right. Sure. And, uh, Sirianni, the distraction of Coach Sirianni. Like, let's be honest. If there is one reason to not trust the Philadelphia Eagles, for most experts, I think most people would agree the reason to not trust them in a deep Super Bowl run is Nick Sirianni, and that's the reason they fly under the radar, right? Could be, could be. But I just look at this team. I, look, Sirianni did lead them to a Super Bowl. They were leading in the fourth quarter before. I mean, he, he's not a total donut, right? Like, he can, he, he can't do some things. And the coordinators have all the power anyway, as we know. So, But I just look at this Eagles team. Look, we, we're all kind of throwing our flowers at the Lions. And the Lions are great. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm on that bandwagon. Oh, I have boy. been for a long time. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> but why can't the Eagles beat them? Like, they're a game back in the NFC right now. If you're the Lions, I'd be I'd be worried about the Eagles and nobody else. I if I look at the NFC picture, right, right now, I if I'm the Lions, I say I'm not really worried about the Commanders. They're they're flawed. We're going to talk about them in a second. Packers, eh, whatever. Vikings, eh, we, we, they already beat both of those teams on the road. Cardinals aren't there. The 49ers are interesting, but they got to get there. But the Eagles are the team where I'm like, I don't want to really see that team and, and the NFC Championship game because this team brings everything to the table. Wait, wait, we wait. do. I, I'm, I'm a, oh, see, look at me. I'm getting fired. You're telling me that you'd rather face the Lions in the NFC Championship game than the Eagles? No, no, no. I'm saying if I'm the Lions, I don't want to oh, okay. see the oh, okay. Like okay. That's the only team that I, I really fear, unless the 49ers get it going, which I still think they can do. If I'm the Lions and I'm thinking, of, oh, my God, we got two home games for a Super Bowl if they do get the one seed. The only team that I'm like, uh oh, is the Eagles. I think the Eagles could knock off the Lions in Detroit, but that's the only team in the NFC. But I think it would be a great NFC Championship game, and I think I think the Eagles are back at that level they were a couple of years ago when they were. I think they were the best team in football that season, just didn't win a Super Bowl. Well, and they've got. I mean, the thing about the Eagles that's really intriguing when you think about a Detroit matchup is they have two corners in in Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay who are as legit as can be. We saw what Quinion Mitchell did. Uh, to Terry McLaurin, Matt uh, turned him into the, a ghost. Yeah, like, it, it took him took him off the table. Yep, um, for for the Commanders, and that changed the complexion. I think largely of what Jaden Daniels was able to do in that game. I think the defensive line is playing much better. It's you know the, particularly the interior of that defensive line can wreak havoc. Um, the Kobe Dean, the linebacker. I mean, they've got really yeah. Zach got a couple. Vaughn. Yeah, like they, yeah. yeah, their Zach linebackers Vaughn's. are playing. I think our linebackers are the biggest difference in the in pretty the significant. Here. They're, yeah, they're playing absolutely. well. Like Zach Bond might be an all pro. Like he, he might, might be, be one yeah. of the two best inside linebackers of football right now. He is having 14 tackles last night. He's played great. Like, the, and I think it's a lot of this is Vic. I, I mean, Last year, their coordinators were not good last year. They were in over their heads. They lost Steichen again, and they could, really didn't replace them. So they went out, and, and they got Vic Fangio, who is one of the great defensive minds of, of the this you know the last 20 years, right? Like, he is one of the defensive coordinators you look at and you say, yeah, that guy knows ball. And you can see that they're get, like, this game was ugly, but it, a lot of it was ugly because the Philadelphia defense was so good yeah. in this game. Like, they well, really remember, played well. Frank, they were supposed to have Fangio in in 2023 i mean that was mm-hmm. the plan was because he had been an advisor to their team 
um, throughout that run in, in 2022 to the Super Bowl. He had become an advisor for them late in that process. He was supposed to be their defensive coordinator, I think, in 2023. That didn't end up happening. And then he goes to Miami for, you know, what was just a bad experience, a bad fit. And then bad fit. <laughs> obviously, bad, bad yeah, fit. terrible fit. And, <laughs> yeah. and then he ends up back in, in Philly. And you kind of wonder what would have happened in terms of the timeline of this team or the continuity of this team, or maybe we wouldn't have gone through some of what we've gone through with the Eagles. If, if maybe Fangio had just stepped into that role as he originally, I think thought he was going to do. Do you guys agree with me though, that this does look like a two team race in the NFC, maybe three, if you like the 49ers, I, those are the only three teams I would, I would even remotely confidently pick to go to a Super Bowl right now out of the NFC. Well, Lions, I don't trust Eagles. Maybe I don't trust years. Darnold. Darnold's got the yips again, right. so I don't. I don't trust the turnovers from the last couple of games, but I yeah. do trust the Vikings defense. I don't trust that the 49ers are actually going to get healthy. I guess my only pushback to you, like nobody wants to say this out loud, but my only pushback to you is like, what is Arizona not done to belong? If we're going to put San That's Francisco fair. in the conversation, how have we not put the Cardinals in the conversation? Because I, I make a pretty good argument that the way Arizona's playing right now. If we're gonna, if we're going to include the 49ers, we have to include the Cardinals also. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I mean, I, I've been kind of down on the Cardinals all year just because of my preseason expectation of them. Oh, I can't lie; so I, like I can't shake it that I thought the Cardinals were going to be bad defensively, and they're better than that. But I, I can't see the Cardinals winning in Detroit. I can't see them winning in no. Philly. So that's where I come back to the only team out of that too. Like the, if the 49ers get healthy, because McCaffrey's back, yeah. they could end up being a beast by the end of the year. Analytics still love the 49ers. So I, I talked about that Wednesday. So I, I may, I'll put the 49ers in that group, but right now the Eagles are the one team where I'm like, if somebody stops this awesome lion story, it's going to be the Eagles. Cause they're really playing good ball. Do you trust Hertz? That's my question. I mean, it, do you, how much do you trust him? He's been so Jalen? up and down. Yeah, I don't know if I trust Kellen either. I mean, that that offense looked bad most of the game. And, and Saquon bailed them out. Like, two long touchdowns, and it makes it look a lot better. What? But midway through the fourth quarter, the, the commanders are going for two, going for it on fourth down instead of kicking a field goal, take the lead. Like, if they kick a field goal, they lead with 7.55 to go in the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, a, I mean, Saquon makes it look a lot better than it was because for three and a half quarters, the offense was ugly. I'll grant you that on, on Jalen, but he has played pretty well. And he's, man, it, it's it's hard not to succeed with those receivers he has all the time. He's played really well with AJ. I mean, that's the thing. When AJ, yes, that's the thing. When AJ was off the field and then he came back on the field, to me, it was such an immense difference. And that's where I would agree with you when you talk about who's the best offensive player on the field. It it feels like I, I still think it's Saquon by a hair, but I get the argument for AJ just because of how dramatically it changed and how dramatically Hurts seems to change when he has AJ Brown um, at, at his fingertips. I, I think we got to talk about Washington, too, before we get out of yeah, here. Yeah, I, like, I want to talk about Washington. I, I, I think people have to understand – to me, and this was one of the things that I mentioned when you and I were in that discussion last night, um, Washington knew what they were this season. I think they, they've they known, they've been way ahead of schedule on what the record looks like, some of the wins that they've had, uh, the competitive ability of the team. And a lot of that has to do with Dan Quinn, the head coach. A lot of that has to do with Jaden Daniels, the quarterback. But overall, particularly when I talk to people in the organization approaching the trade deadline, they knew like, there's a lot of work to do here. We still have a lot yeah, of pieces yeah, yeah, yeah. to add to this team. And the skill positions are wanting once you get past McLaurin. Like we like Brian Robinson. Very much like, so. Yeah. You know, the backfield depth is 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 okay. Like it's but there's you need, I think, a monster number two behind McLaurin. You don't have that right now. Uh, I think you got to figure out what's going to happen moving forward at, at the tight end spot because you know you draft Ben Sinnott and then the guy can't get on the field for you. Um and and then obviously the offensive line. There's got to be a lot of work done, I think, on that offensive line. So to sort of see what's going to happen this second half, and if you see the commanders get figured out a little bit down the stretch, I don't think anybody should panic. They should just say, okay, well, this is this is the realities of roster construction, and we have what I really think was a, a really important two-year plan. They're only halfway through that right. to really get themselves – turned around competitively. It's just that Daniels had been so good. And and I think Quinn had done such a good job changing the culture inside the franchise that they just got ahead of schedule. Right. Now, I'll, also, give you, but, I'll give you but, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you three reasons why you really shouldn't panic about the commanders right now. Versus Dallas versus Tennessee at New Orleans. Those are the next three games. Like 
if you don't screw that up, you got 10 wins and you're going to the playoffs right. and, and way ahead of schedule, like you talked about, Charles. So go ahead, Fitz. No, the only thing I'd add to that is to your point, Frank, in the fourth quarter, this was a close football game. They didn't get beat uh, yeah, until battled. late in yeah. this thing. Also, it's a short week for a rookie quarterback. I don't think Thursday night games will ever favor a rookie quarterback in the world of prep for, for getting ready for the games. They don't just, they just don't point. have enough league knowledge at this point. So if I'm a Washington fan, I'm looking at him saying, okay, you got me on this one, but do we know that it would have played out that way 10 times okay. out of 10? I, I, don't, okay. I don't know. One thing I'll throw back at you that, that did make me nervous watching last night, Jaden Daniels got he got knocked around last night. Yeah, he did. Like that's yeah, he did. you know he cut he gets a that's cut fair. on his throwing hand. Um, I took a lot of hits last night, a lot. You know, sometimes running the football where he was going to just go ahead and absorb those hits. He made the decision to to go ahead and absorb those hits. Uh, there were times in the pocket where he got hit. It, this was that game where I'm like, okay, yeah, let's. This makes me a little nervous. Like you don't want this yeah. guy to take this kind of punishment in you know game in and game out particularly when some of the runs he was making the decision himself hey i got to go for it here so i'm going to go ahead and and get thumped um and and then the cut it just it's a the first time where i really this season where i really watched him consistently get kind of beaten up and and thought to myself this is what you're afraid of and this is what you got to fix you can't expose him or have him expose himself like this um Every single game. And and I would if I was the commanders, that's the first conversation I'm having, you know, this morning is, hey, all right, <laughs> let's, yeah, right. let's, let's, let's talk about remember that all the offseason yeah, talk. Yeah, let's exactly. go back to that. Yeah, let's go that. back to that a little bit. <clears throat> I'm really interested to see what they do this offseason because the commanders have the fourth most cap space in the NFL. The Cardinals have second, by the way, that <laughs> that's going to be interesting. But talking about the commanders, they have the, the cap to go and get a, a number two. They. I think yep. they just need some field stretchers. Like you look at who their offense is right now. McLaurin is a really, really good receiver, but he's not the type of dude that that's going to really stretch a defense, right? Zach Ertz is fifty years old. Whatever he is, they really Noah Brown ain't, ain't threatening anybody vertically. Diami Brown hasn't really been that guy. I think they need some speed on that offense around Jaden Daniels to just loosen it up a little bit. And he can throw the deep ball. We've seen that. We saw that at LSU. We've seen it already a bit with the Commanders. So. I think priority number one is just getting a deep threat for, for Jane Daniels. We could run alongside Terry McLaurin. I think that would fit really well. I haven't given up on Sanat as a, a really good tight end. Rookie struggle. Like it happens, whatever. I think, but I think that that, I think getting people around McLaurin is the key. I think the weakness right now, Washington, and they probably knew this and other teams know it. If you take McLaurin out of the game, they got no counterpunch. It just right. ain't happening. Yep. Like they, there's just like, again, Brian Robinson's having a great year and Eckler still got some juice. But there's just not enough there. If you take McLaurin out of the game, it's like, well, okay, we're not going to score many points today. You guys have talked about two running backs in cap space, and it just has me think. I'm going to defer to you guys because you'll think of this off the top of your head. Maybe there's an obvious answer I'm missing. When's the last time a team went in and overpaid a running back and it just killed their season? Like for, for all the conversation about don't pay Saquon over this amount of money and oh my God, don't pay Derrick Henry more than this amount of money. Those two players, Josh Jacobs, the, the Raiders chose to let Josh Jacobs go because it just wasn't worth paying a running back that kind of money. I hear that all the time. I understand that all the time. But now I'm watching, to Frank's point earlier, all of these running backs turn around and have tremendous success. I don't think any of the teams that let them walk are better for it. And I'm just wondering why we're splitting hairs on a few million dollars in a position that I just, I don't remember the last time we turned around and said, well, damn, if they hadn't paid a running back, this team would actually be pretty good right now. Yeah. I mean, nobody's going to, because you're only talking about like eight, nine million dollars tops, but like guys like Miles Sanders going to Carolina. And I, I mean, you know when guys, Todd Gurley went to Atlanta. Remember that? Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> wow, Gurley, I forgot yeah. that. Yeah. But so, I mean, it, we had just been on a bad stretch of running back contracts where it was like, uh, maybe don't pay running backs because the hit rate is so low on these guys. But now th that's kind of turned and maybe, maybe that's something Washington looks at. Is there a guy out on the market we could pay? I, I don't, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. Maybe, you know, see Rob, any, you know, impact running backs really hitting the market, but they, they just need to look, you, you talk about it, Charles, you're absolutely right. They were 
they're way ahead of where they should be right now. Way ahead. Like they, they probably should be roster wise, like a five win type of team right now, four wins. They have time to get into this off season and say, now it starts because Jaden's not making any money. We can spend, they've already done it on Marshawn Lattimore. Now they get to spend on other guys in the off season. Yeah. And the thing is too, I don't, this probably isn't the off season to spend on a running back because the draft finally is going to produce a monster running back class. I mean, that's, I, I think there's, very little question that the clearly on the offensive end, although tight end looks pretty solid, uh, the the running back class that's coming in in 2025 is going to be very, very deep. Yeah, you're going to be able to, we're going to see maybe more than one first round running back. We're going to see depth. We're going to see, and and they're different types, right? You're going to, you can, you're going to get guys that are versatile, um, explosive. You're going to get big guys who look like they're bell cow players. Um, it's, it's so, I don't, maybe this is that off season where you're like, ah, maybe let's, let's not spend a, on a running back this off season because we actually yeah. have a draft that can answer that need and can probably answer it in round two or round three. It's not going to be like last year where we're sitting there going, well, maybe no running back's going to come off before or the John, third round. Or Jonathan Brooks and his ACL is the best right. back. The top yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The only thing the I'd say can... is that look, looking online right now, looking at spot track, uh, the top three projected available NFL free agents at running back next year. James Conner, Aaron Jones, Najee Harris. Those feel like the sort like uh, Conner and uh, Connor and Aaron Jones will both be right around 30. It feels like those are the sorts of guys that were like, ah, don't pay a 30-year-old yeah, running back. And I'm kind of looking out. around. I'm like, why? I, I mean, Aaron Jones it, is another guy on that list. The Cardinals have a buttload of money. So just, yeah. just, no, it, see, those, got, those are the Mixon guys to me. Those are yeah. the Texans going and getting Joe Mixon when – the Bengals are like, yeah, we're not paying him. Like he feels right. pretty washed at this point. And then the Texans get him now. Now he obviously suffers an in-season injury, which I really think had he not suffered this, you know, the injury he suffered early in the season on a hip drop, yeah, on a hip on a hip drop tackle, we'd be talking about him right now as is this guy one of the top four running backs in the league? Like that's oh, how absolutely. good he looked. Oh, absolutely. He's I mean, been looked awesome amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, to me, those those are players that. If the right offense that has a quarterback, has surrounding skill position pieces, and a good coordinator wants to go out and pluck a guy for a season or two, mm-hmm. all three, I, I'm comfortable with all three of those yeah, things, frankly. Connor's with, a, to- with the Connor's right a tone setter. Like, yeah. Connor has set the tone for this Cardinals team. I truly believe that. Like, when I when I think about like the makeup of their team and Jonathan Gannon, I'm like, I, James Conner probably has to be one of Jonathan Gannon's favorite players right now because he sets a tone for a team that's improving. Yeah, like he's just crazy. hard. He's such a hard physical player, and, you know. Which exactly. is why, I like, to me, we can go ahead and just clip this off and shove it out to the world when it happens. If the Cardinals, with too much money to spend this season, decide to spend too much of that money on James Conner, who cares? Like, everybody will freak out. Oh, you can't pay a running back that much. <laughs> hey, Ken. Like yeah, at some can. point you got the money. I like, I, think I don't know too. why we care so much about the contracts that our favorite teams dish out when it's like, I don't really need to worry about my favorite team's owner saving money. So I don't care about that portion of it. And paying a running back is not going to prevent you from winning football games. So if you want to overpay to keep James Conner in the building, by God, go and ahead like, and do it. And Panthers just did this with Chuba Hubbard. I think he got 33 million over four years. When you look at how much the cap is, that's nothing. It's it's the difference in a mistake between like a and not to bring up the Raiders, but Christian Wilkins and a Chuba Hubbard is it's not even the same ballpark. You're, uh-huh. you're not paying those guys. If you miss on a Chuba Hubbard or you overpay James Conner or whatever you're going to do at running back, it's not really setting you back that much because it doesn't cost you that much relatively to other positions. Uh, Christian was hurt. Thank you. Uh, it's not a mistake. Yet it's too <laughs> early to call that with mistake. his teammate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, <laughs> you know, y'all. I'm not going to lie. I picked a weird year to get sober. I picked a weird year to stop drinking. Uh, all right. So from fixing random teams to fixing the Cowboys, uh, C. Rob wrote a great article on the path to fixing the Cowboys. Uh, we'll break it down coming up because I think it's just it's important to tell you all that Dion's not the answer. We'll explain why when we come back. <laughs> Can we just pull back the curtain a little bit and reveal something to the world that the world should know and does know, I think, but I'm just going to lay it out very clearly. Get up on ESPN. Uh, there is someone on Get Up that literally monitors by the second when people tune in and tune out. On those daily TV numbers they get, they know exactly when people tune out. There is a reason Get Up talks about the Cowboys all the time because people tune in to the Cowboys. The people that are watching Get Up watch longer when they talk about the Cowboys. So the next time you hear a stupid take on ESPN, a network that was very good to me and that has changed my life, the next time you hear a stupid Cowboys take on ESPN, remember that this is not by accident. Like they sit down and they're like, people love Cowboys talk. 
talk. What's a good Cowboys conversation? So, the, and this is not like a conspiracy theory. This is also not trashing the network. Like this is just how it works. So when I was doing radio five days a week for ESPN, we come in and they'd be like, well, somebody mentioned Dion to the Cowboys. That's juicy. We should talk about it. So you're like, okay, we'll form an opinion on it. Like that's the way it works. I have to say that loudly because all this Dion's headed to the Cowboys talk might be some of the stupidest stuff. See, Rob, like I, I, I just, I can't make it make sense other than the fact that it's really good TV and it's a really good conversation and everybody's going to yell about it. And that's how people get ratings. That's how things get clipped off. That's how we get more traction on our right. shows. That's how everybody gets paid. That Like everybody's going to make money off of Dion and the Cowboys, but you cannot tell me that that would really fix da- Dallas or that that's like imminent. Well, you can't tell me it would fix Dallas. Okay. And I want to be really clear about this. To me, my biggest problem is the idea of let's go get Dion and then let's tank and take Shadur Sanders with the oh. number one pick in the draft. Okay. Oh. Like that's the, that to me is now before we get into that, could the Cowboys hire Dion? I don't put anything past Jerry Jones Jerry. at this stage. Mm-hmm. Honestly, yeah. if he's going to sit there and continue to walk out and talk to reporters about 30 years ago when this guy did that and 30 years ago when this guy did you know, this other thing, or Michael Irvin was crying, or, you know, this memory that's caked in, this yellowed, dusty, (laughs) like, an an attic memory that he keeps pulling out to make some kind of connection to 2024, I absolutely can't look at that man and say, there's no way he will look at Deion Sanders and go, uh, no, I can't have that guy as my head coach. And, And by the way, let's be real about Deion Sanders. He's done a Good job at Colorado, right? I mean, they're they're seven and two. They've got a chance to to fight their way into the college football playoff. Um, There's there's zero question in my mind that at least what he's been able to do on the college level works. But I would remind people, it doesn't work the same way in the NFL. And anybody who knows college athletics and knows the NFL now understands you cannot churn the way he has churned at Colorado to completely uh, turn over that roster. And by the way, import his best two players in, in <laughs> Travis Hunter and, and Shador Sanders. Travis Hunter, who's, I think, the best player in college football. Yeah, good um, Heisman. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so, I, you, you know, you can't just import the two best players on your team, one of which happens to be a quarterback, the other one who happens to be, again, the one of the best college football players we've seen, in, in, especially in terms of a two-way ability, Maybe in my lifetime. I don't remember yeah, ever. Yeah. I've never seen a two-way player like that uh, in my lifetime. And then on top of it, churn basically your entire roster uh, en masse through the portal over, over a two-year span. You can't do that in the NFL. There's cap problems. There's grown-up problems who aren't going to listen to everything you have to say, particularly if there's not success pretty quickly. Uh, you know, there's there's far more media problems on an NFL level than there is in Colorado and seeing sort of some of the things that that Dion has, you know, gotten a burn his saddle about. Uh, on the NFL level, you're going to get criticized a hell of a lot more every day. than you do every, <laughs> every day. day. And yep. Far more, far more. And there's going to be questions constantly, especially if you're struggling well, how long is Jerry? Is Jerry going to do? Like, is he going to fire Dion? Like, when do they move out to Dion? And every opening press conference every year is going to be about, well, okay, you didn't get to the Super Bowl, so what's the deal? What, like, what's the mandate? How? What's the timeline? It just everything about it to me screams a, a, a major catastrophe, which would probably be great for all of us in the media. But you can't look at me in the face and say this is the thing that the Cowboys need to ultimately fix the problems that they have, especially when you say getting rid of Dak Prescott uh, is part of that equation after he's signed a monster extension. And we don't even know if Shadur is really going to be a great NFL quarterback. Like we've, we've talked to Nate Tice a bunch about this class and he doesn't really love any of these guys. Like Shadur is doing great in college. I like him. I actually do, but he's far from a sure thing. I think he, would he be the seventh quarterback taken in this year's class? Like, would he be high Bo Nix? Probably. Like, or at least close in that in that range, right? So, I don't know necessarily that this whole, like, and we're seeing it with other teams, too. Like, the Giants, what they need to do to fix everything is hire Dion and draft Shadur. Like, uh, I, I don't know about that. Dion is very interesting. He's very charismatic. He has turned, look, as everybody knows, I'm based in Colorado. And from when I moved here in 2003 to a couple of years ago, I honestly never had an 
any decent conversation about Colorado football, which is weird how anonymous they were in this market because they won a national championship in 1990. Like this was a, a big time program for a while. Nobody cared any iota about Colorado football. Then Dion showed up and that's all anybody wants to talk about. He has completely transformed that program from just an interest standpoint from how good they are. But I don't think his act plays in the NFL. I really don't. Like I, I just... He could come in and, and and treat these college kids a certain way, and they might be starry-eyed, and the parents might be starry-eyed, sending their recruits to him and all this. But I don't. I think a lot of what makes him work in college would not work in the NFL. We'll see. I don't know. Like he, He's a smart guy. He could adapt. But I, I don't think he's going to be some success in the NFL if he ever wants to go to the NFL. And I definitely don't think it would work with Dallas. Dallas's issues, it, it's not hiring Deion Sanders that's going to fix them. It, it is... And it's not getting rid of Dak Prescott either. Let me tell you, it's just they have a lot of cap issues now with these three guys getting paid. They got to find the right coach. They got to draft really well. Getting back to the fundamentals and not necessarily stealing headlines so you could be on get up for three hours every morning. But th think about this: Dion goes to Colorado, where he has done a great job. But the first thing he did is made it clear that he didn't want any of those players. So he gets rid of all of them. Then a year into Colorado, offensive line isn't good enough, essentially. They go out, and he makes it clear they're going to buy a new offensive line. You can do that in college football. Yeah. You can just go out to see Rob's point and rebuild. I think what we're missing here is that not only uh, will Dion not be the right answer to fix the Cowboys, I don't think the Cowboys are the right answer for Dion. If he's going to leave Colorado right now, there's a much better opportunity for him to stay in the sport that he's having so much success in and simply go to a Florida State team that he has connections to that's become an abject disaster. I mean, the highest-paid college uh, coaches right now make about $12 million a year. Jim Harbaugh for the, the Chargers reportedly makes about 16. So there's not such a huge financial difference that I suddenly say we got to get to the NFL to get paid. Dion could get an absolute incredible offer from Florida State should they decide they want to buy out Mike Norvell, which is not cheap. But if they decide to do that, Florida State could back up the Brinks truck, pay him like an NFL coach, and he can do exactly what he does. He can rip through the roster every single year. He can become a turnstile for what football looks like he can recruit in a hotbed that he loves, and he can sit in Florida at Florida State with a place that he has such a tie to and have tremendous success. He can be Dion and be the king of college football, or he could just go be another part of the Dallas Cowboys history. I don't understand why the ego of Dion Sanders would value the Cowboys. As much as NFL fans will kill me here and say, because it's the Cowboys. Okay, well, if you're Dion, you don't need the Cowboys. If you're Dion, you can get that same sort of respect and level of, of connection to something that matters to you at Florida State with a lot less heart burn with a lot less Jerry Jones making basically the same money and you can churn and burn the roster to your liking. Like it's just a better fit for Dion. I, I think it's funny that you said you don't understand how the ego of Dion would, would <laughs> facilitate him ending up in Dallas. I totally understand how it would. I mean, I, I remember being at Cowboys practices where, you know, Dion would show up with a bunch of kids and he would be, it, 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 it was be like, in a way, practice would stop. You know, everyone, oh, Dion's here and, you know, he's even though it's on the sidelines, he's not really doing anything. He becomes the center of attention um, mm -hmm. inside that that practice, which is wild. I mean, it's and, he's one and of those it, dudes, man. He, he is one of those he walks dudes. in a room and, and he takes over like he has yeah. his charisma yeah, but he is off the he, charts. Like it's he doesn't get more, though. He doesn't get wins above replay. He's always going to be that dude. For of Dallas. course. No, that I doesn't that. change if he's the coach. Like, OK, if he's the coach, he's, it, it could actually tarnish some of that over time. I, I understand all of that. But again, we, if you're talking about ego. Right. And you're talking about the cowboy like there's. The Cowboys are all about ego. They're, they're literally every day their <laughs> primary owner wakes up. The, the the one man who's the general manager and the, and the head coach of that team for decades wakes up. It's all about ego, right? It's all about I'm the one who can fix this. I know what's right. Um, and and I do think there's an element of a him gravitating toward at times, less so in recent years, but at times shiny objects and shiny objects from the past so it's yeah i could see how this could end up happening i don't think there's anything as you've talked about fits i don't think there's anything that makes that the right fit i think the florida state uh connection and and what you laid out is smart like to me that makes a lot of sense particularly if you're florida state you're going okay we can get Dion in here that could be an influx of money that comes into the program we can start to 
you know, renovate and, and bring up to date a lot of different things inside the Florida State program. Um, and and not only does it potentially change us on the field, it potentially potentially recalculates the entire infrastructure of the Florida State football program. So, yeah, I mean, I don't I love that that potential connection. Um, but again, when we turn this back to the Cowboys, it's the tiers that we're talking about here. You're not getting rid of Dak. OK, you just sign him to an extension. You're married to him. Yeah, Jade explain to everybody why. He's like, second give, in give the me, MVP last year. Come on. Right. Like, he's we not all a agree. bad quarterback. He's, he's having bad season. But even if they hate him, even if they decided this afternoon that he sucks. See, Rob, explain to everybody why they it's can't just It's a $90 million dollar cap hit. <laughs> you're going to go ahead and you're going to. And by the way, a $90 million dollar cap hit with a team that's got a ton of players already pressed against the salary cap as it is in terms of the extensions you want to do. Right. Like if you if you're like, oh, we're going to move on from Dak. Okay, well, you're also moving on from, you know, probably Micah. You know, you're moving on. It just, it, I, I guess you could go ahead and play that game of let's split it over two years and let's see if, you know, what we can then do with that cap hole. You know, maybe we fit Micah into, into that cap hole moving forward. Okay, well, then what's your answer at quarterback? Um, it's, it, there's far too many issues when you, when you talk about the contracts that already exist on that team. And, you have an offensive line that's that's in disrepair. I mean, there's there's pieces that are going to have to be swapped out there. Zach Martin's probably Zach Martin, done yeah. as a Dallas mm-hmm. Cowboy. How does that really change the dynamics? And and again, I know it's not the Zach Martin of years past, but you you're talking about an offensive line that has not looked good this year and and looked consistent this year, but I think could be even worse next year. So there's there's all of that you have to work on. The wide receiving core beyond CD. Okay, Ooh. I mean. What what is there? Right. Uh, nothing. I mean, nothing. The, you know, the, just the skill positions in general. You don't have an impact running back, a truly impact running like Rico Dowdle. Now that they're committing to him, maybe he can be a piece moving forward. But I still think there's more addition that has to be made there. Personally, and I know nobody wants to hear this. I do think you go into this offseason and you go, we're not going to actively shop Micah Parsons. But we're going to pocket list him and we're going to go ahead and let people know that if they want to call us, <laughs> phone lines are open. Maybe what's under the guys, what's that, maybe under what's the guys are like? talking about somebody else. Let's let's we we're willing to have a conversation about Micah. I don't think you move. And and what I brought up when I wrote about this, Brian Burns drew an offer of two first round picks plus from the LA Rams at one point. Brian Burns, when he was with the Carolina Panthers, you cannot tell me that Brian Burns being worth two first-round picks to any NFL team does not make Micah Parsons worth, at bare minimum, three first-round picks. And the maybe Rams would more. do it, right? The Rams would be the team to do it. I, I mean, like, ah, I, sure, uh, maybe. Why not? I mean, who knows? Yeah. But I, you don't know that until I think you're willing to sit there <laughs> right, and go, right. okay, are we willing to sign him to a contract that's going to be the highest-paid non-quarterback in the league? Yes, we're willing to do that. So what are we looking at? 37 to $40 million, depending on how that negotiation goes moving forward. Okay. So we have that on the books, but that's also a salary hole. We could take advantage of if we were willing to deal this guy, if there's a team out there that gets desperate and says, Hey, you know what? Screw it. Like we're, we're pretty close. We've already got a team that has a window. Let's say the next two or three seasons, let's go ahead and burn three first round picks. Maybe we even throw in a player. Maybe we do one of these crazy trades that we haven't seen happen in a while and we sell out for a guy that we think can be that dynamic piece for us in the next three years. And we turn the key on on, you know, a Super Bowl contending roster. And it, it, even if we lose in the conference championship game, OK, our pick is twenty nine or thirty or thirty. You know, it's twenty nine or thirty. If we get it to the Super Bowl, it's thirty one or thirty two. Cool. Like, let's go ahead and and burn those for a generational edge rusher. I, I think for the Cowboys. You got to listen to it and at least see if someone out there is willing to get a little crazy this offseason. What about, what about, hear me out, uh, addressing a need for both sides? It would be complicated to have to do a franchise sign and trade sort of thing. What about T. Higgins and some extra stuff 
goes to the Cowboys. It addresses their other need at wide receiver. Micah Parsons goes and hangs out with Trey Hendrickson. I, You're laughing at me. I, Come on, let me, let me make this happen. Look, they don't even, because Fitz, they don't even want to pay Trey Hendrickson. <laughs> they don't, they don't, they don't want to pay Jamar Chase. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't, don't want to pay anybody. It's the old like, sheep so, Bengals. Are yeah. Back. So I mean, yeah. come on. Like they, like Hendrickson was a guy that I think at the trade deadline there were some teams yeah. that are like that guy wants more money and they're not giving it to him. Maybe we can get him at the trade deadline. That didn't end up Damn. ultimately end up happening. But yeah, as Frank said, T Higgins. They're not. They don't want to do that deal. Jamar Chase. They don't want to do that deal. Which Jamar Chase stupid. could have a My two God, thousand yard stupid. receiving season. This is unbelievable. They, they didn't pay Jamar Chase. That's unbelievable. Jamar Chase is. I had to look it up the other day when he was just going nuclear against the Ravens. I'm like, wait, did Jamar Chase really not get his contract? Like I yeah. forgot. I thought he did at some point because it's so outrageous that yeah, he didn't and Frank, pay him. That that got cheaper, right? Oh geez. Oh my <laughs> God. Cheaper now. What's like, Mike Brown doing? <laughs> yeah. What is my, so one question. Can I ask you a question? Because this this does interest me. We talk about the Dion stuff and that whatever. But what type of coach do the Cowboys get or should they get? It's not Dion, obviously. But like, and I'm not even asking you for a specific name because everybody would be like, Ben Johnson. Well, yeah, of course, I get that. Is it like some offensive guru who could turn that side around? Is it a disciplinarian? Is it a defensive guy? Is it a, a, sec- a guy who's on his second time around? A young guy? Like, what profile can at Cowboys coach can fix the Cowboys you know, going forward? You know how we've approached it in the past where it's always been head coach, general manager, let's, let's, let's interview and hire these guys in sets. You know, we went, we've gone through that rotation where it's like, oh, let's get this guy with this guy and see how the energy works or these two know each other. So you really, you're hiring, you're hiring a pair who come in and then lead the franchise, the coach and the general manager, uh, you know, Kyle Shannon and John Lynch, that whole deal. Right. Um, I think there is a different dynamic now that you can look at in terms of hiring in a pair especially when you already have your quarterback in place. And what I think that is, it's a motivator and a tactician. I think you want a motivator in, uh, personally, I think in the top spot is where I would want my motivator. And at the offensive coordinator spot is where I'd want my tactician. But if you have to flip it, that's fine. I don't have an issue with it if, if you have to have You know, look, the tactician, particularly if it's an offensive mind who's going to be connected to that quarterback, if it's like, let's say, Ben Johnson, we'll just throw a name out there because that's a name everybody's going to talk about Detroit, the offensive coordinator, or Bobby Slowick from Houston or whoever. You hire that tactician. He's going to be tied to Dak for the next however many years they're together. You know he can game plan. You know he's ahead of the curve right now when it comes to offenses in the league. The next position that you hire, though, then it's like, can Mike Vrabel get a job? Because if Mike Vrabel isn't going to get a job in the next rotation, I go to Mike Vrabel and go, want to be our defensive coordinator? They can you know, pay him. I mean, they can pay the money. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we absolutely can pay you to be the defensive coordinator, and you will be the highest profile defensive coordinator in the NFL because you're the defensive coordinator of the Dallas Cowboys, and you're Mike Vrabel, who you know had a, a very high Q rating with the Tennessee Titans. Sure, there's some tarnish on it now, but you don't really have to worry about that. And geez, look what it did for Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn came through, put together some some great schemes, really coached some players that probably weren't the easiest to coach at times. Now he goes to Washington and in a way he's the toast of the league, right? So you can, it is, there's a slot there for the Dallas Cowboys, particularly if they can get an innovator at the head coach position. There's a defensive coordinator slot there that should be attractive to some coaches out there who have the ability to use it as a springboard pretty quickly. And and if, again, if Rabel's not going to get another job, a head coaching job, which we'll see, I wouldn't have a problem. I Last year, uh, you know, there was some, I heard some people when you talk, making calls about what, you know, could happen with Rabel. I heard some people were like, well, he could go back and be a defensive coordinator. And last year I was like, what? Like, why? No, he can't go back and be a defensive coordinator. And then he didn't get a job. And and then I watched Brian Flores in Minnesota and some of the things that he's doing with the Vikings, a lot of the things that he's doing with the Vikings. And, I, and I'm like, OK, well, if you miss a window to get back in and you but you're a quality coach and you've shown it on the field. OK, the right defensive coordinator position is absolutely worth, um, you know, making that that trip. It's worth the freight. And I think Vrabel and Dallas would would definitely be if they can get the 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 right head coach to pair with Dak at the top. I hate, it's just totally scooping dirt on Mike McCarthy here. Um, <laughs> I think that's the tandem. We haven't mentioned his name once. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's yeah. Just all of a sudden right there. That's the first Mike McCarthy <laughs> reference in all of this. Poor Mike McCarthy. I, look, I, people can have whatever opinions they want about Mike McCarthy, but I will say this. That job 
some of the things that Mike McCarthy has dealt with, oh, have, watching him on podiums at times when he's been up there with Jerry and Steven and everybody, or he's had to react to what Jerry said on the radio or every awkward intro about, well, okay, Mike's contract's running out or uh, well, are you going to extend them? And like, what's the, what's the measurement here? What a pain in the ass position. And Mike McCarthy, to his credit, has handled that about as well as anybody I've ever seen in that sort of a position. You know what? You know what Mike McCarthy's record is with the Cowboys. It's 45, pretty good. <laughs> Forty-five and thirty-one. He's fourteen he's, games yeah. over five hundred. Like it hasn't been all that bad, but that's not how the Mike McCarthy era will be remembered. No. If he gets fired, does he get a job somewhere else, McCarthy? I I think he's. I look. I know this is like a. This sounds dumb coming out of my mouth. I think he's a really good coach. Like the record is the record. He he is a six sixty one percent win percentage in his career. That's good. Yeah, and you could be like, oh, he had Aaron Rodgers. Well, that's fine. He also reasonably had success with the Cowboys, just not in the playoffs. I think McCarthy's a pretty good coach overall. I do. I look. I think. Um, I, you know, it's it's a difficult question to answer because. It's it starts to become okay now. This is like the third job, and then when it's you know there, there's definitely people would be lying to you if they said that owners don't have the word retread in in their minds. Like they don't want to hire coaches who have been through multiple head coaching jobs and not go, gotten over the hump. And if they do hire those coaches, it's usually it's, this guy's really you know extremely charismatic, or you know he walks in and immediately can can win a room. He can you know convince the owner that. This is why these last two stops didn't work out, even though, you know, he won a Super Bowl. You know, people forget that Mike McCarthy is not he actually has some hardware uh, to brag about. I, I think he's worthy of it. I think it would be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but is he it, would he certainly be up for jobs? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't I think Dallas is a not a blemish on his record at all. I think it's something he can point to and say. You know, hey, we got we got it turned in the right direction, but the circus was in town, and I ended up uh, still and winning. He's not blameless, though, Frank. Sports. Let's be honest. Like no, that's, no, I, I was I there for that. the Packers playoff game last year, and and I felt, and I wrote this, and I've repeated it since. I felt walking out of that game, Mike should have been fired, but I also felt like Dan Quinn should have been fired because I sat there and I looked at a Cowboys team that, to me, was absolutely geared and built to make a Super Bowl run. That just absolutely got the break speed off them by a, a Packers team that had that no, game. they had no business walking into AT and T Stadium and embarrassing the Cowboys that way. And I felt like Mike absolutely deserved credit and blame for that. I felt like uh, Dan Quinn deserved blame for that. I felt like Dak deserved blame for that. And and so I'm not going to just sit here and be like, oh, well, Mike's just been great and it's everything else. No, I mean there have been no, times when Mike's it. come up it. short too. Yep. All right. I, I have to ask you guys, of course, we're going to take a quick break and we'll get to quarterback stock exchange. But you guys earlier said that tanking for Shadur and Dion together is a terrible idea. After the break, I'm going to ask you, is that a terrible idea for everybody? Look, I, I hear you and I agree with you. The concept of, of tanking for Shadur and Dion is terrible. But this thing is going to get more legs. Everybody's going to talk more about it because people pay attention to Dion. So as we look at teams that might have a top five pick, are there, does it always make sense? Is, is it always a bad idea? Is there any reason, like, would any of you for any, whether we're talking about the Giants, whether we're talking about the Raiders, obviously, you're talking about teams that are devoid of quarterback talent. Would you suck enough to try and get Dion? If that was part of the way you had to get Shadur, would you, be, would it even be worth it, Frank? I, I think that the, the difference is I, I, the way you framed it. I would never be like, let's take the rest of the season for these guys. But let's say you end up at the end of the season, you're the Giants, and you have the second pick, which they have right now, Jacksonville's first. And all of a sudden, do you think like, okay, we got the second pick, we could pull off the Dion Shadur? I wouldn't do it, but I, I don't I don't know that anybody should do it. No, the answer is no. The answer is just, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. Idea. I'm trying no, here. Okay. I'm trying, but the answer idea. is just I'm, no. I'm genuinely I mean, asking. Is, no, no, I get it because, because you do have, look, maybe Dion, like, I've kind of dismissed the, the idea of Dion as an NFL coach. Dion's actually figured out college pretty well, uh, not having really the, no. the, he didn't work up the ladder or anything. Maybe he could be this. And look, other coaches without the X's and O's expertise, Mike Tomlin, Harbaugh, all them, 
they John Harbaugh, not Jim. They figured out the NFL and how to be a CEO head coach, but I don't, I, I'm going to say no to all this, but I guess there's some window where you're like in five years, we're like, oh my God, Dion and Shadour just won a Super Bowl together. I, I guess there's some like fantasy land where that happens. It's just not a road I'd be going down. You have to prepare for the worst. And that is, a, this is a psycho dynamic if you're an NFL team to go, okay. Let's go ahead and go get Dion, who's not like any other coach, right? He's not. He's not. Nope. He's not, not like Wallflower. any other coach in college. He's, he's not, not like any he's, other coach. He's, no, he's one he, of one. He talks. He is a celebrity. Like he's he, he's absolute he celebrity. He talks. Everybody listens, right? He's on 50 million commercials. Social he's, media all day, yeah, every day. Social media. Yeah. I mean, like, he, he will fight with reporters. All these. So just from a coach standpoint, he alone, you really have to sit there and measure and think like, okay, like, are we prepared for this? You know, what everything that this brings along. And then you're going to say, let's put his son as our starting quarterback <laughs> in the NFL, where grown men in the locker room, when his son yeah. makes mistakes, are going to go, can I go to the coach about this? I don't. What about our leadership council? Can we talk about Shadur having problems? Like, are, are, what does that do? What's what's our relationship like with Dion? If we have criticisms of his son and, and we think his son's not getting it done, could we actually have our voices heard? What if, let's say the coach fails, let's say Dion is not the guy, but Shador plays reasonably well. What happens if you have to fire Dion but keep Shador? <laughs> what happens if Dion does a good job, but Shador is just not cut, cutting you, it yeah, and you, you, and you got to move on Shador, from the quarterback? Yeah. What the hell? Like you're yeah. basically bringing in two guys that the onboarding and offboarding with those two would have to be <laughs> in tandem. We're bringing it's we're not bringing in one entity here and one entity there. No, we're bringing in a set. And if one part of the set goes wrong, we're probably going to have to move on from the entire set. It's just a whole massing of problems that I think is completely different on the NFL and I cannot underscore enough the idea of what NFL locker rooms are. They are adults. They're people earning paychecks. Yeah. They have families. There are a lot of business decisions that go on in locker rooms and a lot of business considerations that go on in locker rooms. They react completely differently than college kids who are sitting there and frankly, if I'm being honest, can still be pushed around. Um, you know, Parents who can still be silenced. All these different things that happen on the college uh, uh, level because they're not 100% professionalized, they're semi-professionalized now, but they're not 100% professionalized, that's going to go far in the NFL without it becoming problematic. God forbid, imagine if imagine if Dion and Shadur are New York Giants and it doesn't go well. And we know how that market goes when it doesn't go well. We know how talk radio goes when it doesn't go well. I give you one player who speaks out anonymously against either Shador or Dion, you can't tell me that that organization would not be turned upside down trying to figure out who was the guy because we got to get him out of here. I, it just, it's, I think it is, a, it is a mess waiting to happen and I'm sure a lot of us should be rooting for it. And if it's a mess that's going to happen, we should be rooting for Dallas. We should be rooting for it happening in New York. We should be rooting for it oh happening in one of these places. Oh, yeah where it's just going to be, it's it's the sun at the center of the universe. And it's, we stare at it for, you know, <laughs> 16 hours of the day or 10, you know, you know, 15, 14, 12 hours of the day. It's unreal. I, I can't even talk about this. Is, it, it makes my palms sweat even thinking about it as we're sitting here. <laughs> but that's a smart, the onboarding, offboarding portion of this is a smart part of the conversation that I haven't really heard anybody focus on. And, and it's very real and it makes a lot of sense, you know, and, and that's, that's something that the organization has to consider. It is interesting, too, the way you say it. Like, you have to prepare for the worst case in these situations. Uh, I think fans kind of need to hear this right now because I also think it's a little bit weird to presume that Shadur is such an incredible prospect that he's going to be able to sit down in a meeting and say, well, I'm not playing here unless you bring my dad in as a coach or vice versa. That, like, that I just, might happen, Neither though. of them. That but might that happen. might happen, Fitz. Yeah. That might happen. I, and do yep. you think it team like I think a team would knock him down the board if he came in with that? Like he's not that prospect. He Fitz, ain't him. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. I, so I have a piece up today that looks at the top five, you know, semi consensus top five prospects coming into the 2025 quarterback class, and just how it's not a great class, very underwhelming, very similar to the running back class in 2024. A lot of split decisions, um, just a whole lot of 
like underwhelming talent that that you really should not be hoping to build your franchise around. And I will tell you, when you talk to people about Shadur, it does not go very long in the conversation where they go. And then there's the other baggage and the other baggage they're talking about is being honestly afraid of Dion, afraid of if we draft this guy and, and they're not thinking in terms of we draft this guy and then we bring Dion in to be a coach. They're thinking, look, if we just draft this guy, how often are we going criti- to be criticized for what the scheme is, how we're bringing him along, the surrounding players around him, every other thing? Like it, it's, it is, it's this whole uh, extra element of outside chaos that I think teams are clearly thinking about when you look at him as a prospect. What are you inviting in? It, this isn't it, like teams get annoyed at when they have players whose dads like post some nebulous thing on social media. Here's a clip of, you know, Roma Dunes Odell Beckham dad, being wide you know, open. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Roma Dunes's dad being like here, like showing all these routes where Roma Dunes is open, you know, and you're, and you know, the bears are like, geez, like really, man, we got to do it. Like, come <laughs> on, man, what are we doing here? And, and this is totally different. Like Dion's not going to be subtle. Like someone going to ask Dion about something. He will just straight up say it. Just like Dion said, I want like, look, you, you said, and I'm paraphrasing here. You make sure his kid ends up in the right place. He's not going to be in the wrong place. And I personally, I don't have a huge issue. Look, Archie Manning did it. It's not like we haven't seen it in in the past. Um, and and frankly, I, Archie was probably right to to make sure that Eli Manning ended up with the Giants. Won two Super Bowls there. The the Chargers were a mess. AJ Smith with with the Chargers at that time, may he rest in peace, was a spicy guy. And and there were potentially issues you could see coming down the pipeline uh, between him and the Manning family. So look, there are there dynamics where I can understand Dion saying and doing what he does. Yeah, does that affect Shador Sanders? Yeah, absolutely. I think it does. And last thing, real quick, I'll say this about that quarterback class and about Shador in particular. Everyone's it's an underwhelming class. It's below average, as Fitz said earlier in the episode probably all these guys would have come off the board seventh at the quarterback position behind Bo Nix in the 2024 class, or it would have been at least a debate. Um, pay close attention. And I, I can't wait to, to mention, you know, make sure that Fitz hears this. Pay close attention to two things. Number one, the college football playoff, who gets in and then who can make noise, because I do think there's an element of momentum that can be galvanized by one or multiple of these quarterbacks in the college football playoff. And the number two, I had an exec that said to me, I thought this was so great. He was like, look, you might do all the right work. You might everything you, you hit it perfectly. You hit it on the head and an owner might come in and go, yeah, I want us to take this guy. <laughs> and I think, and yeah. Mark Davis may have the number one pick in the draft. And I think Mark Davis is 100% capable of walking into a room where his front offices and scouts and everybody you know, says realistically, we don't have a quarterback with a first round grade on it, or we don't see any of these guys being worth anywhere near the first pick in the draft. And Mark Davis says, yeah, let's take Shador. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think you're right. I, by the way, I, the, this is a terrible year to need a quarterback. And most yeah. of the time when you're in a bad year to need a quarterback, my, I preach patience. Like you're better off just taking the best player on the board. You need to rework your whole roster. You're not good enough anyway. That's the smart football strategy. At some point, you got to have somebody. This year has gone so bad for the Raiders. I, I understand, like, you want to take a swing. It's just uh, the, the Raiders, I think, have a very real shot at ending up with the first pick in the draft for the first time since they took Jamarcus Russell with the first pick in the draft. And I don't think that this pick will be any better than Jamarcus Russell was with the first pick. In the, I, can't be I think worse. They will it can't reach, be worse. It's got to be better. The, they they're they're going to reach a quarterback. It's not, reach, it's, it might not be a good year to have a, the first overall pick, like, just at any position. Like, I don't, I don't, seriously, there might, yeah. it'll be interesting as we get closer to the draft here. I'll be curious if any absolute bona fide number one surfaces. Like, to me, this feels like the Eric Fisher, you know, the, the yep. Chiefs are like, well, we don't, there's nobody, <laughs> we're just going to take Eric Fisher number one overall because he's a tackle and we think he can play left tackle for us and he'll be okay because there's nobody else out here for us to, to cast this pick on. That's, that's what this draft could be. I, I literally had one exec tell me, he was like, I wouldn't, he said, if I had like a top six or seven pick, I wouldn't have any problems trading into the 30s. He said, because I think a lot of grades 
are going to be pretty similar, pretty similar. at mm. six, seven, eight as the value that you're going to be getting at 31, 32, 33. You know, he's like, I, I just that talent shelf for the top end players is really, really, really small. So this is a bad year to be bad. I, I personally Sorry, <laughs> I personally wish it was was going to be Cam Ward. I personally think it's going to be Shador Sanders. And it personally, if I, I could have a voodoo doll, it would be none of them until the second if it's round. It's Cam but, Ward. Cam Ward was, and I know one season can make a massive difference, but Cam Ward was like a third day pick last yeah. year. He was a deep yep. third day pick. It's unusual. Now it does happen. I remember going to the Manning Passing Academy and, um, I was standing there and I was talking to Justin Herbert and there was a guy in the corner and because it, it's in, it's held in Louisiana, there were like 40 people around him and it was just me and Justin Herbert. And I'm like, why am I with the possible number one pick of the draft <laughs> and by myself? I was like, who's the guy in the corner? And, and somebody said to me, I'll never forget. It's so classic. He's like, ah, oh, he's like, uh, uh, that's the LSU starting quarterback. He's like a third round pick, like Joe Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, okay. One season can really yeah. change minds Jane, and reveal Jane some wasn't things. considered a first rounder. Before no, 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 he was yeah. not considered yeah, a first like round pick at all. Like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was, it yeah, happens. So it can happen. Look, I, I, my my dream scenario would be Cam Ward at the top of the second round, but that will never happen. Like all of these quarterbacks right. we're talking about are going to be picked in the first half of the first round, and yeah, none of them are going to be worth takes it. over. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all right, real quick before we get out of here, quarterback stock exchange, I want to end on a positive. You are up on C.J. Stroud. Uh, tell me why. Well, I mean, Nico, Nico Collins is coming back. I think a couple of things happened. They shuffled the the offensive line, right? Like, they were having problems at center guard. They yes, just they flip-flopped were. center guard, you know, because they, I think they just realized, look, this is – we have to make a change here. We feel like the skill set is, is conducive to us just flip-flopping these two players. Um, and Nico Collins, to me, who's – I, I think he's a top two receiver in the league when he's fully healthy and he's fed. And and that makes a, a, a huge difference for the Houston Texans. Him coming back into the fold, I think is absolutely immense. And interestingly enough, John Mechie kind of turned a corner last week. Mm -hmm. John Mechie finally got fed some some passes and, and he had a good preseason too. And there was hope inside that franchise that John Mechie was going to have an opportunity to contribute. It was just sort of, I mean, we have we just don't we don't have one ball. And how many ways can we split it? And at that time, they're going Nico Collins, Stefan Diggs, Tank Dell, uh, Joe Mixon, uh, Dalton Schultz. Like we we we're only going to have so many opportunities. Well, through injuries, Mechie has gotten his opportunity. Remember, this is a guy who was a second round pick when he came out, battled leukemia, and and it's been a long fight back. But I think the Texans are sitting there and going, "Oh, okay, Mechie is now up and running, and he's a piece." Absolutely, we can work with, and we're going to get Nico Collins back. I think that's going to resolve um, some of the worry that we've we've seen around C.J. Stroud the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, look, Stroud is not bad this year. He's been okay, given with all, all he's you know dealt with. I, I I did chuckle at you putting Nico Collins top two because I'm wondering if Justin Jefferson or Jamar Chase gets bumped from the top two spot. Which which of those guys I think are? He's, see, that's the thing. I think he's in that conversation. Like I really do. I think I he's in terrible. I think he's a terrible. Like I, I think there's about three, four guys who are just uh, unbelievable, and then Nico's in that next tier. He's he, he's close to a, a, a top tier guy, but the yeah, thing is, he's not Frank, you haven't yet, seen. No. I, I I think you have to see him for a full healthy season at the That's level fair. he's playing at. Now he got hurt this year, right? So if your argument is, hey. He's not in the top two, and here's why. When you look at how these other two have played, I think he's capable of playing to that level. Granted, I look, I'll give you the W that, yeah, he, he got hurt, so that obviously um, disrupts where I think he goes. But I, I said it in the preseason. I think this guy is, if you feed him 140 you know balls, 150 targets, he's going to be an all-pro player, and I truly believe that would have happened. Oh, he was he on an all-pro trajectory for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No okay, when what's happened. the all-pro? Like, to me, you're talking top four. Right. All yeah, pro? yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, no, he's he's in that. He he was played great, and he's going to help CJ, and he's going to help that whole offense. It's it's just one of those things where the plexiglass principle hit CJ Stroud and the Texans, where they improved so much in one year that the next step almost had to be a little bit backwards. So I I hope Stroud, you know, that we because we all talked about the Lions win on Sunday night, and we didn't really talk about the Texans collapse. Like that was a bad loss for them in so many ways. I hope they can get it turned around because I like seeing stars in the NFL. I I like seeing ascending teams in the NFL. The Texans should be that. They're just taking a little bit of a step back. Hey, but like you said, a big part of that's Nico. I got to ask you, did the James Houston thing 
and I don't really want to describe it. <laughs> did the James Houston thing, the the poop emoji, did that? Did he really? <laughs> did he? Did he really soil his pants in that game or not? Like that's. I, a, I, 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 I think so. Amonra St. Brown, like there's like a podcast clip out there that's floating around, and it, and Amonra St. Brown seems to indicate that it happened, and I've never <laughs> seen that happen on an NFL field where seen, a player yeah, seen guys puke. Uh, we've, yeah. We saw he said he sat in Gatorade. Here. He said he sat oh, in Gatorade. God. Oh God! Like, look, I know. Uh, I, uh, I've talked to plenty of offensive linemen to tell you that there's been. It, it's not uncommon to pee your pants. Like it's just the. It's you know number one, your pants happen sometimes in the game. You're just like I'm doing this, but like. The number two in the pants. I, that's bad. Yeah, I don't do that. Do the little Lamar Jackson. Go back to the locker room. Like Lamar yeah. does. Like yeah. Lamar yeah. running back to the locker room all the time. Like, what's he going? Oh, he's just taking his Lamar bathroom break. He's fine. It's not even that it happened. It's just what do you do for the next for the rest of the game? Like, I, I just wouldn't be able to forget that it was in there. Like, that's the oh. part that you sit in Gatorade. Right. Obviously, that's yeah, the, that's, that's the oh, elixir. Oh, right. Right. We have oh. left on a high note uh, this week. Frank and I will be back. Sunday night. I'll try to remember his name Sunday night. No promises. Uh, you can follow us all on social media, of course. And huge shout out to Emmy and Stone, the producers of the show behind the scenes, doing God's work, as I always say. Uh, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, do all that stuff. It really helps us. And uh, tell your friends, family, or enemies, tell everybody to hang out with us for every single episode. Have a great weekend, y'all. We appreciate you listening.